Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'm bringing you an edited version of the live Q&A vlog that was recorded in November of 2021. And I do want to mention that if you prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you could do so by supporting the Patreon campaign at any level. By doing that, I will give you access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear the audio versions of all of the vlogs that I put out. Now, speaking of patrons, I have actually put in some questions that were asked by the patrons before this live Q&A. So I have filtered those in amongst the rest of the questions that come in through the actual chat while the vlog was being recorded. Now, I do want to ask that if you enjoy this video that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. And on that note, I think let's now jump into those questions. The first question I'll be answering today is actually uh, came from the uh, patron, so we're going to go for that and then jump into the chat. Uh, this one actually came from TC3P, who's been a supporter of the channel for quite some time. Uh, they ask, or they say, uh, they really enjoyed the unboxing and setup video that I made for the Patreon backers, and they're happy for a chance to peek behind the curtain. Do I plan to continue making those? Uh, now, if you're not a supporter of the channel, you might not know about this, but this month I'm doing some experiments with different types of exclusive content, and I did an unboxing and setup video for Imperial Steam right before I filmed the full tutorial for that one. Um, I just turned the camera on when I was opening up the box and I set the game up like I normally would, but I talked about it the whole way through and then did a bunch of fast forwarding. Um, it was kind of fun to do. I've only done one of those so far. And um, I think for a lot of games, there's not enough stuff in the box to really validate that. Um, but I'm hoping to continue experimenting and uh, probably do that kind of stuff as well. Um, it, sen it seems like it makes sense to do those as I'm setting the game up for an actual tutorial. Uh, I received Brian Boru a couple of days ago and I was like, oh, maybe I should make an unboxing for that, but I wasn't in a good situation for it with the filming table because there's the game all over it, and uh, I just ended up unboxing it on my couch. So maybe that was an opportunity missed. I don't know. It's it's uh, cool to see that you enjoy that one, and I tend to keep making uh, this kind of exclusive content to just experiment around and see if people actually enjoy it. All right, next up, we have another question actually from the uh, Patreon supporters. Uh, this one comes from Dave Brown. Uh, they say, wouldn't it be better to have written the rulebook for a less complex game than Darwin's Journey before being thrown uh, at the deep end with it? Uh, so Dave is referencing the fact that I wrote the rulebook for Darwin's Journey, uh, and that's actually the first rulebook that I've ever written from scratch. Um, I started working on this wow, like 11 months ago? I think it was uh, December of uh, 2020. And I guess to a certain extent, yes, it would have been better for my first rule book that I ever wrote to not be this massive, incredibly complicated Euro game. But, you know, you kind of take the opportunities that are given to you. And this is the first time somebody offered uh, me to actually do this. Uh, Dave uh, goes on to ask, why do you think Thundergriff Games chose you for it when you'd never been solely responsible for writing a rulebook before? Um, <laughs> I asked myself that question when they asked me about writing the rulebook. Um, it seemed like they just trusted me. I'd made several videos for them in the past, and I'd also done a little bit of proofing for some of their rulebooks. So it seemed like they just felt like I must have a good idea for where these things can go. And honestly, I think part of it is they just really needed a solution. And I had just about a week before emailed them about proofing uh, a rulebook, uh, specifically the Darwin's Journey rulebook. And I think they realized that they said, yeah, we want you to proof it. And then I think they realized, actually, we need somebody to write this as well. And they gave me a shot. <laughs> uh, I, I hope it turned out well. I mean, it, we are still working on this thing. Or I guess we, we wrapped it up, I think, about a month ago. Um, but this has been a much longer project than I anticipated. And if I'm being honest, I feel like I probably could have done better. I feel like uh, the stuff that I've written since then, because I have written actually several rule books over the course of the last year since then, I feel like I'm a much better rule book writer now, which makes sense because that was my first one. So hypothetically, I should get better at these things as time goes on. So yeah, in a perfect world, my first rule book would not be uh, 63 pages of Google Docs for the base game and then like 30 pages of Google Docs for the uh, expansion and whatnot because it wasn't just Darwin's Journey. It was the Firelands expansion and then like six mini expansions as well as an additional rule book content for the collector's edition. It just was a lot. And it's actually been really satisfying uh, going through this whole process. It's been quite exciting. Uh, and um, I just talked to them yesterday about writing two more rule books. So uh, things definitely seem to be going well there. The next question comes in from uh, Dame Zumari, and they ask, are you happy with the Friendly Ties format? Do you think it is a sustainable format for you? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, to give a little bit of context here in case people don't uh, know what they're talking about, uh, Friendly Ties is a podcast that I started along with my good friends Anastasia and Nick. Um, I won't go into the nitty gritty of <laughs> the long backstory for it because I've talked about it in vlogs, but Friendly Ties isn't really a John Gets Games product. It's it's this other thing that's kind of adjacent. It kind of rubs elbows with John Gets Games because so far, uh, all of the episodes on Friendly Ties have been uh, the three of us discussing 
a game that we just played or almost honestly reviewing uh, the game that we just played because we now seem to be playing these games quite a bit many times before we actually talk about them. Uh, so it, it really is a group effort between all of us versus, you know, John plus a couple of guests. Um, so I definitely, you know, enjoy working with my friends like this. It's been uh, honestly intensely satisfying to make uh, this kind of stuff, <laughs> to talk about games with people who also love to talk about games just as much as I do. I feel like uh, the two of them honestly make more insightful commentary about games than I do as well. Uh, so just being on that level, having these discussions and then putting them out there has been awesome. Um, either way, um, coming back to your actual question, um, the second question, I guess, is do you think it is a sustainable format for you? And I certainly hope so. It's definitely sustainable for me because I think I've proven over the course of the almost last eight years that um, I have no problem talking about games on end, you know, indefinitely. <laughs> now that it's been a full-time career, I still have no problem talking about games forever. Um, and it seems like my uh, two friends, Anastasia and Nick, are really enjoying this one as well. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly trying to take their temperature to make sure that they are uh, just as happy as I am to be doing this because it's important that we are all happy and this, you know, doesn't become something that we have to do instead of something that we want to do. But so far, so good. I mean, it's only been going for about two months officially, but um, I've been very happy with, uh, with it overall. And I, I think they have been too. All right, let's move on to the next question. And this is another one that came in from the Patreon supporters of the channel. Uh, this one is from Brian Brazil. Uh, they uh, they say that I mentioned that I played Kalos for the first time and saw it as a board gaming merit badge. What would be the next game on my merit badge list that you'd like to play but you haven't gotten a chance to yet? Uh, now, for a little bit of context there, um, part of the exclusive content that I've been making for the patrons is an actual kind of impressions vlog, review vlog type thing where I've been uh, talking about all the games that I've been playing recently, whether or not I like them or not. Uh, I've been uh, quite honest and it's been really fun to make that uh, as content for the patrons uh, in a little bit more of an informal atmosphere. And um, I talked about Kalos because I talked, because uh, I played Kalos for the first time ever about two weeks ago. Um, now, <laughs> the merit badge thing, uh, I'm a Boy Scout or I was a Boy Scout or whatever. Uh, and <laughs> that means uh, the merit badges are just, you know, the little things you put on your sash to say that you have the woodworking merit badge and the orienteering merit badge. And I said, I got my Kalos merit badge because I played it at once. And this is, you know, arguably the first uh, worker placement game. And it's just one of those famous classic board games that I had never played. And it just seemed like I should at some point, And I'm glad that I have. Uh, and <laughs> if you'd like to hear more about my opinions about Kalos, then please support the Patreon channel uh, at any level and you'll be able to get access to that. Uh, now, as far as future merit badges, yes, I have quite a few. Um, there were a couple that I rattled off the top of my head. And then I went through the Board Game Geek uh, top 300 games, just skimming through to see what games really jumped out to me as surprising that I hadn't played and games that I've been meaning to. And I wrote them down. I actually wrote nine of these down. And I'm not going to go into detail about all of these, but I will tell you about the nine. And I put them into a uh, list of like the, the top priority merit badges down to the lowest. And the first one is Agricola. Um, I haven't played Agricola before. And I, I use air quotes for that because technically I played Agricola once in 2010, uh, about a year into my, you know, falling down the board gaming rabbit hole. I remember nothing about it. Uh, the rules were taught to me incorrectly and I had a miserable time. So I guess I don't remember the rules to the game, but I remembered really disliking it because key scoring rules weren't revealed to me until the end of the game. And it was like, oh, by the way, you have a negative score because you forgot to enclose all your stuff in. And I was very sour about it and I never came back to it. And I want to come back to it because Agricola is such a <laughs> classic game. I really uh, feel like I want to play it. And also I feel like I should have played it. That's a merit badge I should have. Uh, after that, there's El Grande, which is a uh, like the classic area majority uh, type game, which tons of people love. I've heard so many great things about it over the years, and I've never even had an opportunity to play that one. Uh, after that, there is Twa, which is a dice drafting game that is very well loved by people who like Euro games, and um, never had an opportunity to play it. So that one's definitely one uh, near the top of the list. In fact, we almost played Twa the same night we played Kalos, but the person teaching it remembered Kalos better. After that, there's Russian Railroads. Um, I've been interested in playing Russian Railroads since it first came out back in Oh, what would that be like, 2013 or something like that? But I never had an opportunity. I don't think I knew anyone who owned a copy, and I didn't want to play it enough to buy it blind. And, you know, time went on, and I never tried it. Uh, this is a uh, Euro game. It sounds like it's a train game, but uh, from my understanding, it's a very Euro-y game with lots of tracks and stuff, and I like Euro games with tracks. Like, not train tracks, although I think there are train tracks. I think there's actual tracks where you move your little tokens up them. Uh, after that, there is Age of Steam slash Steam. I know people who love these games hate them to be lumped together, and I know there's some subtle differences between the two, but um, I haven't played 
either. Really? Again, with air quotes. I, I have actually played one of these. I just don't remember which because it was back in 20, uh, 2009. And it was like in the first month and a half of me joining up to a meetup group. And I was learning like seven or eight games a night. And uh, the meetup organizer loved this game. And he sat me down and I played it. And I just remember feeling really overwhelmed. And I had no idea what was going on. And I don't remember anything else. I, I don't remember if it was Age of Steam or Steam. So that's another one that I feel like Technically, maybe I have the merit badge, but I don't deserve it. So I want to get that one for real by playing uh, that one. Um, either version, honestly, as far as I'm concerned. Although it seems like people tend to talk more about Age of Steam. So maybe that one has a slight priority. Uh, after that, there is Indonesia, which is a splatter game. Uh, I've played several splatter games like Food Chain Magnate and Antiquity and at least one more, but it's, <laughs> I'm totally blanking on it. Uh, but Indonesia, I've heard amazing things about for a long time. And it's just one that I, I would really like to try at some point, but I haven't had the opportunity. Uh, next up, there is Village, which is a classic Euro game. I say classic, it's not as old as El Grande or um, Kalis, but it's, you know, certainly I think about 10 years old or so. And it has this mechanic where the people in the village uh, are born, they grow old and they die and you have to put them into the cemetery. And there's like this village cycle thing going on. I played My Village, which was the dice game version of this, and I quite liked it. So I've been wanting to play Village for a long time. Uh, next up, there is Trajan, which um, I think only came out about seven years ago. So not crazy old, but uh, this one is a Mancala type game. It's uh, one of the most well-regarded Stefan Feld games. And it's one I've been just curious to try. And finally, there is Blood Rage. Uh, this is a Eric Lang design, and I've never played it. I, I've, I know so many people who have mentioned it in the past. A lot of people really like this game. And in general, I don't find myself gravitating towards Simon type big plastic miniatures type games. But from what I've heard about Blood Rage, I feel like this one I will potentially actually like versus others. And honestly, just from a merit badge perspective, I don't even care if I dislike it. I just feel like it's a game that it would be good for me to have played so that I will know how it plays. And that's just a good backbone of, you know, mechanics and stuff like that to actually speak to. So yeah, those are the top nine uh, board game merit badges that I am uh, actively seeking out. Um, I mean, obviously there's a ton of other games that I'm playing, um, but these are ones that I would really like to have happen at some point. And that turned into a longer answer than I expected. Sorry about that. The next question is coming from Hans, and they say, which of the new Essen releases do impress you the most gameplay-wise and originality-wise? Uh, now, I haven't played all of them, or even that many of them. Uh, honestly, I've just played Ark Nova a whole bunch and Golem a whole bunch. <laughs> I have not played Boone Lake yet. I haven't played Messina yet. Um, I have not played Brian Boru yet. I haven't played, you know, a lot of the Essen releases. I didn't go there, and I don't have copy access to most of these games. Um, but I will say between Ark Nova and Golem, which we've played a whole bunch, Ark Nova is uh, definitely squeaking things out right now. That one is, is at the top, which I'm really happy to say because after the first time I played that one, I was... I was thinking it was just not going to be a game for me, but now I, I just genuinely really like that one. I like the theme. I like the mechanics. And honestly, I mentioned Friendly Ties earlier. If you'd like to hear a lot more about it, then please uh, check out the Friendly Ties episode with our Ark Nova discussion because the three of us have a lot of things to say about that game because there's a lot to say about it. It's a very fascinating game overall. All right, let's go to another question from the chat, and this one comes from Jinrei. They say, "Do you have an, uh, did I have an opportunity yet to try out 10 with my local board game group? Uh, yes. <laughs> Now, I apologize. I don't want to sound like I'm just shilling for the Patreon uh, uh, support campaign the entire time of this video. But uh, yeah, I talked about it at quite length in an exclusive uh, uh, segment for the patrons. Um, that one, along with a bunch of other games that I've been playing, like, um, well, Golem back at the time, but also Coffee Traders and just a bunch of others that I can't think about, plus 10, uh, were all games that I played recently, and I gave my impressions of that one. Uh, I've actually played it twice. We played it two uh, days in a row uh, because a friend of mine that I taught it to who I was staying with enjoyed it so much. I didn't like it quite as much. Um, but yeah, if you want to hear my extended thoughts on that one, then please support the Patreon campaign at like any level, even the lowest level will give you access to uh, that kind of stuff. And you can hear me talk about 10 quite a bit as well as a bunch of other games. Uh, let's go back to a patron question. There's uh, four more of them. Uh, and this one comes from John Paul. Uh, they say, do I have any games in the past year that have significantly changed my opinion about with additional gameplays, either liking the game much more uh, than you originally did or liking it much less than you originally did? Um, I went back through my entire year's worth of played games to try and answer this question, and uh, three of them jumped out to me. Uh, the first one is Ark Nova. I'm not going to talk about it really at this point because I've talked so much about that one lately. But as I even briefly mentioned earlier on in this uh, Q&A, um, 
I was not convinced I was gonna like this game after the first play. I was pretty down on it, which surprised me because I thought I would love it. But then with each subsequent play, and I think I've played it six times now, um, I've enjoyed this game more. Uh, and I, I wonder at some point where I'm going to actually plateau, but I haven't plateaued yet. So that one started out uh, high expectations, low reality, and then it's skyrocketing up to being one of my favorite games that I played this year. Uh, the other two games I'm gonna talk about have actually had my opinion going down a bit. One of them is Sheepy Time, um, and I actually talk about this quite a bit in that Patreon exclusive video because I'm also uh, going back to games that I've covered before. I'm kind of considering it sort of an ongoing review process where when I play a new game, I talk about it. When I play a game I've talked about before, I talk about it again because sometimes my opinion changes. Uh, the short version of what I said in that exclusive bit was that uh, Sheepy Time is uh, lowering in my expectation, in in my uh, uh, appreciation of it because of weird downtime from the busting mechanic. Um, I've seen many opportunities and I've been in the position uh, several times where I bust or maybe I even leave the round early and stop and then I just sit there for like 10 to 15 minutes while other people do stuff. And that downtime is kind of frustrating, especially if you bust on a crazy bad set of luck, which I've seen happen a couple of times. And um, there was one uh, circumstance where that happened in what I was what was gonna be the last round of the game, I was pretty sure, and I was right. But that meant I essentially stopped playing the game like 20 minutes before the game actually ended or 15 minutes, which was frustrating because I knew I got bad luck. I busted because of that. And then the game is probably over for me because somebody was probably going to win. Um, the other game I wanted to mention is Blue Lagoon. Um, I picked this one up for $5 at a board game flea market. I couldn't help myself. Uh, I played this one once a couple of years ago and liked it. It's an area majority um, two phase Reiner Knizia style game um, that I really enjoyed the first time I played. So it was a no brainer to pick it up for five bucks. And then I played it a couple times since then. And I actually realized that I wanted to like this game a lot more than I actually liked it. Uh, the base mechanics of it are super cool. You lay out these canoes and people in various lines doing area majority, then you score stuff, you clear most of it off, and then you do it again with slightly different rules. My issue with it is that when the game is over and at the midpoint, there is a ton of scoring, and that just did not feel very elegant to me. It wasn't really what I was looking for in this game overall. Um, it, it, it almost seemed a little bit clunky with the number of things that had to be scored. Also, I don't mind area majority in general, but this game had a lot of calculating and recalculating, trying to make sure, okay, am I still uh, in the majority on this island? And this island, and this island. Oh wait, I miscounted. Let's do this one and this one again. Um, honestly, Ar uh, Aristocracy has uh, bumped Blue Lagoon out of my collection. It's uh, also a Reiner Knizia game, but it does not have area majorities. It has some other stuff going on, which again, I actually talked about a bunch more in that exclusive bit because I played that one a lot recently. And I guess, I guess I could talk about that one. That could be the fourth one I could talk about here that my esteem for aristocracy has gone up very well, very high. I played it once at PGG Con a few years ago and liked it, but then I played it like three or four times since then. And every time I play this one since, I'm enjoying it and I haven't taught it to anyone who didn't actively like this game. Uh, so aristocracy is also on the up and I'm really glad I have a copy of that one. All right, let's come back to the chat. Uh, and Shrey says, on writing rulebooks, have you been able to run uh, blind playtests using one of your rulebooks? No, I have not been able to do that. And, you know, the main reason for that is, I guess, the pandemic. Although, uh, I guess the main reason for that is because no one's asked me to and I haven't really thought about doing it just yet. Um, that is a very important thing. <laughs> I, I definitely uh, think that Every rulebook should be blind tested um, just by having somebody read it, even if they don't actually have a physical version of the game in front of them. Uh, but that's, um, at least from my perspective, not been part of the workload that's been asked of me. I've just been asked to write the rulebook. Uh, and then um, other people have done some editing and whatnot. Um, that is a good idea, though. That is certainly an interesting thing to think about. Uh, you know what? I'm a total liar. <laughs> uh, I did, with the Darwin's Journey rulebook, send this out to a couple of friends uh, before I sent it to the publisher. Um, I think I sent it to Anastasia, actually. She was one of the first people to see it. Uh, and then I sent it to uh, a couple other friends um, when I specifically did the solo mode rules for Darwin's Journey because those were not easy to write the rules for, and I wanted to make sure they thought it actually made sense. Uh, and they actually did do blind testing of it. They, they tested the solo rules using my rulebook in Tabletop Simulator, and I got a bunch of good notes from that. So I take it back. <laughs> yes, I have done a little bit of it, uh, but I think it was just for Darwin's Journey, probably because I was so nervous about it. I'm not against doing it more in the future, but um, it's not been something that I've thought about, and I, I'll try to think about it. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, let's go to another question from the chat. Uh, Simon says, do I experience new game fatigue sometimes? Uh, as in, do I have periods of time where it seems like no new releases manage to generate any enthusiasm for me? Uh, yeah, that's definitely happened. Um, I feel like that happened earlier this year, um, but I'm not sure if it was a new game fatigue situation or just a 
my personal life was in a, uh, in a state with just the amount of stuff going on, the amount of work for John Gets Games, and also just the inability maybe to see people uh, in real life as much as I wanted to, where I just did not play that many games for a few weeks. There was a, a month this year where I barely played any games, um, kind of on accident. Um, I suppose if uh, a bunch of hot new games were coming out in that moment, then maybe that would have kicked my, my butt into gear and to actually get those games played. Uh, I've definitely been playing a lot of games over the last five or six weeks, and, I'm, and probably part of that is because of these SM releases that are becoming available, like Ark Nova and Golem, at least, using Tabletop Simulator. Uh, so yeah, it, it does happen. Um, in general, I'm usually always down to play board games. Uh, if I don't play games for a few weeks or even to a, a month, it's probably not because I'm sitting here saying I don't want to play games. It's probably because some outside force has stopped that from happening to me. All right, let's move on to another patron question. Uh, this is a long one. Uh, this comes from Flo, and they say, the last decade or two appear to be, uh, to me, as a golden age for board games, with so many innovative ideas, me mechanisms, designs, and people contributing to a constant evolution on the medium. Do you ever see this phase waning, maybe when all possible game mechanics have been fully explored, or do you see board games as a medium that has the potential to evolve for the foreseeable future? Uh, this is a great question, uh, one that I don't have an amazing answer for, but I did want to talk about it briefly because... Um, Maybe I'm just being an optimist, but I really don't see things changing uh, uh, in a big way. Well, I take it back. The, the only constant is change, right? Everything is going to change. But I like to think, and I hope, that going into the future, that as things change, um, they don't get worse, <laughs> I guess, if that makes sense, that, that, that it's not going to have less innovation and that kind of thing come out. Um, to a certain extent, maybe we are having less innovation. Maybe there's just a lot more uh, tweaks on general themes that are happening. But, you know, it seems like every few years, some big thing emerges as like a big trend, like, uh, well, deck building about a decade ago. Uh, Legacy about five or six years ago, um, and then Roll and Write about two years ago just exploded. I mean, it's not like it was the first time any of these had happened. Uh, well, I guess Dominion started deck building, but um, I think you get my drift. Um, the idea that all good ideas have been had and that there will be no more in the future just doesn't really seem like something that's ever happened in the past with humanity and just in general, uh, not just board games. So I like to think that that's probably not going to be a thing that changes for board games as well, um, specifically at least as far as running out of ideas. I think humans will come up with new ideas all the time. Uh, sometimes you smash a couple of ideas together to create something kind of new as a hybrid, and sometimes you do that and realize, oh, there's this other offshoot from it that really is its own new thing, and that can turn into whatever. And, you know, we won't know what that is until somebody comes up with it. Uh, I'm sure, you know, a year or two from now, there's going to be some designers kicking themselves about whatever the new trend is and not realizing uh, what that was going to be to ride it. So, um, again, not the most satisfying answer to your question, I think, but I'm an optimist, and I think, you know, I've been heavily, heavily passionate, uh, practically addicted to board games for like 13 or 14 years now, and uh, I've seen a lot of these trends happen, uh, come and go, uh, but I've never sat here thinking, wow, nothing good is is happening anymore. Maybe the hobby has is, is grown too stale. Okay, the next question comes from Mark Simpson, and they say, do I feel that reviewing and or giving detailed impressions of a game based solely on plays in TTS might flavor your feelings slash impressions one way or another over playing with components in real life? Um, I mean, I guess it'd be silly to say that it wouldn't change my feelings about it at all, but I guess I don't really feel like it has that big of an effect. Uh, that's mostly because my the priority for me with board games is the mecha mechanisms and just playing things with my friends live. <laughs> I, I really prefer to play board games that way. Um, so not actually touching the pieces is not really a big deal to me. Uh, you know, the component quality of board games almost never factors into how much I actually enjoy it. I mean, occasionally components will wow me and I'll be like, oh, wow, this you know, this is really nice, this thing over here. But even a game that has really drab, poor components, it, like I'm not going to be like, oh, I'm not going to play that game because I don't like the way it looks or the, what, the way it feels unless the way it looks and feels actually detracts from how it actually plays, like if it makes it actually hard to play the game. Uh, but also, I've been an avid video gamer for most of my life, um, not really the last decade because of board games have kind of taken over, but I'm, I've am i been very comfortable in a video game space uh, with the controls using the keyboard and the mouse. Um, I was very, very, very addicted to World of Warcraft for the first three or four years when that came out. It came out when I was in college back in 2000. And uh, and I was playing that game like 80 hours a week while somehow still passing my classes. So um, I don't have, I guess, baked into my brain, I don't have a problem staring at a computer for ridiculous amounts of time. Uh, whereas I do know some people who haven't really played that many games over the last year and a half because they just can't bring themselves to stare at a computer when they play the board game. So it's definitely going to affect some people. But for me, I don't think the way it affects my impressions of the game, uh, uh, I don't think it affects it in a way that, that has an appreciable uh, overall impact on my feeling for it. 
All right, let's move on to another Patreon question, and this one comes from Dave Brown. Uh, they say that um, you're a fan of Ark Nova and Golem, yet criticize or at least aren't keen on Teotihuacan for being too complex. Isn't there a contradiction here, or are my tastes changing? I think this is a great question. <laughs> I really like seeing this one come through because I have some thoughts. Um, yes, in the past I've mentioned um, that games like Teotihuacan um, aren't really something I keep coming back to because, you know, of, of the complexity that's there, but diluting it down, or I guess distilling it down to say, oh, it's too complex and that's why I don't like it, is is actually kind of missing the mark. My issue with games like Teotihuacan, which honestly you could bundle in most, many or most modern Euros that are being made right now, is I don't like Euro games that have so much complexity that didn't seem like it was necessary. I am totally okay with a complex game where every single piece uh, is needed. Uh, Imperial Steam, for example, is a game with a lot of rules. <laughs> I made a tutorial for that a week or two ago, and that one took a while. But I really like Imperial Steam, even though it has all these different uh, uh, mechanics that work in very different ways, and it takes a while to see how it all works together. It all works together. Um, I could not sit here and say, oh, I would prefer to play Imperial Steam without X or Y part, because every single piece seems like it's necessary. My issue with Teotihuacan and many other games, but to focus on that one, is it really felt like that game shipped with like two expansions worth of extra modules and stuff that were stuck in there that I would rather not be there. Um, they are, are all these tracks in this game, tons of tracks in Teotihuacan, and you only interact with maybe a couple of them each time you play the game. If you really focus on trying to go up those tracks, then you're probably not doing any part of certain other parts of the game. And, and some people like Euro games where you only play with like a third of the game each time and you, you mix up which third of the game you're going to play. I am not that kind of person. I like to play all of the game every time I play with subtle uh, emphasis. Uh, so like if I'm playing Imperial Steam, maybe one game I focus a lot on the investors and I do some track laying. Uh, in another game, I go crazy on tracks and maybe don't do that much with investors. But I will like to do, I like to, you know, touch every single one of these things each time I play. So again, the complexity isn't really a problem overall. And, you know, going over to like Ark Nova and Golem, for examples, um, I don't think that they have things that I could um, casually just say, I wish X mechanic wasn't in there. Um, you know, there's a lot going on to both of these games, but it seems like everything is necessary to tell the overall, you know, mechanical story that they are going for. Um, one game, uh, Gaia Project, which came out Many years ago, honestly, kind of before this trend really got huge, uh, my big complaint with Gaia Project was uh, the Gaia forming part of the game, which felt a little bit weird because it's, the name of the game is Gaia Project, but I remember feeling like I would much rather play Gaia Project without the Gaia forming mechanic. That almost felt like an expansion's worth of stuff that was added in, and I wish it was a module that you could excise because I feel like, for me, the game would have been better because of it. Uh, so yeah, there's just a lot of Euro games coming out with so much extra stuff, and I feel like, you know, not every Euro game needs to be this complex. And I guess, you know, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but to kind of come to something of a point, uh, it seems to me like a lot of Euro games are being made more complex for complexity's sake, when they didn't seem like it was necessary. I feel like there's a better game um, for Teotihuacan in there with less stuff attached. Again, a better game for me. Like, a lot of people love that game, and I don't begrudge them, and I'm not saying they are wrong, but there's a better game out there for me with that. There's a better version of Gaia Project out there with one or two less things really honed in on what's going there. Uh, Stroganoff is another game that I played on Tabletop Simulator, where the central mechanic for that game is so good. I really, really like what's going on there, but then there's so much extra stuff that feels like expansions worth of content that you kind of have to play with every single time. Um, if there was expansions worth of content that you could just not use in sort of a beginner mode, then I'd be totally fine with that, but that's often not the case. Um, so anyway, I think I am maybe talking about this one too much, and hopefully I've been able to articulate my feeling on this a little bit more uh, when with regards to all of these things. Um, you know, this doesn't seem to be really changing as things are going forward, and I think a big part of that might be Kickstarter. I mean, Teotihuacan did not go up on Kickstarter, but but it does seem like, you know, Kickstarter lends itself to lots of stuff, extra, you know, components, extra uh, mechanics, extra modules, and that's not really where I want my Euros to be. Again, I'm totally fine with my Euros being quite complicated, as long as it feels like it was all worth it. And, you know, that's completely subjective, but, um, you know, from one game to the next, whether or not it's worth it, um, but that's just where I stand with it. Okay, let's move on to Kenneth. They say, I'm looking for games that are fairly light with quality playback. Got any favorites? I own quite a few board game of Board Game Geek's Top 20, but don't always have time to play. Uh, yeah, there's some complicated games up there <laughs> in the Top 20 for sure. Um, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to come up with specific game examples on the fly, but I will say that 
your question right there, what you're saying, is part of the reason why I have been liking Cube Rails games so much. Uh, I'm not going to go on a long pro uh, proselytizing rant about them right now, but I will say that um, one of the reasons I've enjoyed them is because their rule books in general are very lean. They have uh, simple sets of mechanics that work together in fascinating ways to um, lead to a lot of really great circumstances. I, I really enjoy the fact that most Cube Rails games can be taught in less than 10 minutes, and then you play the game in around 60 minutes, so you could play, you know, two to three Cube Rails games, teach and play two to three Cube Rails games in the same amount of time as you could play, like, some of the more modern, heavy, big, complex Euros that are out there. As far as some other ideas, I mean, uh, aristocracy is one that jumps to the top of my head uh, just because I was talking about it. I mean, not necessarily because it's the best recommendation, but it's there in the, the front of my mind. Uh, that's a Reiner Knizia game with a really great central mechanic uh, where you draw three random tiles from the board at the start of each turn, and then you do an action based off of the stuff that's revealed. It's It's got this subtle incentivization thing going on. It's got a subtle kind of lottery type vibe to it because you're flipping these over randomly but you choose where you flip them from and every single game I played to this at least at some point somebody flips over a tile and just jumps up from the table they're so excited about what they found so it kind of has that you know winning the lotto kind of vibe to it uh, so yeah that one's really up there honestly a lot of Reiner Knizia games <laughs> could probably be uh, up there but I'm having a trouble coming up with other examples sorry about that Kenneth uh, next up oh <laughs> Reiner Kinesia is also in the next uh, question here. Shrey says, no Kinesias on your merit badge list? Have you played many of his higher rated games? Uh, I think so. Uh, I, I saw a whole bunch of Kinesias games in those top 300, and I think I've played essentially all of his biggest ones, uh, you know, like Tigers and Euphrates, uh, Raw, as well as... Oh my gosh, there's so many. And again, I'm so bad at just recalling games on the fly when I'm live. Uh, but uh, I did not see any in the top 300 uh, of uh, Reiner Knizia's games that I hadn't actually got to. Um, I guess one that sticks out a little bit is I think My City is up there in like the high 200s. And I haven't played that one, but I wouldn't call that a merit badge. It's definitely a game I would not mind playing, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it a merit badge. Um, there, there are certainly games in those top 300 where I'm like... <sighs> You know, oh, I've heard a lot about that game, but I've never played it. Like War of the Ring, for example, is in the top 20, maybe even the top 10. But it's not on my merit badge list because I don't really have any interest in playing it. <laughs> even though it's a classic war style game, Lord of the Rings theme and all that, a lot of people love it. It's not necessarily one that I'm going for. I do tend to really like Reiner Knizia games, it's true. And I think that's probably part of the reason why I didn't have any on that list because I just happen to have actually played those. Um, but if you can think of any that you think maybe I haven't played, then then throw it into the chat. and We'll see if I actually have. This is the last Patreon question, uh, so then the rest will be for the chat. Um, this one comes in from Brian Brazil, and they say, how is all the experimenting with the channel going? Do you have any ideas in the hopper? Uh, so again, <laughs> uh, over the course of November, I've been experimenting with a bunch of exclusive Patreon perks, uh, various um, uh, types of content, like um, kind of moving my impressions vlogs over there and talking about the games I'm playing and the games, uh, the new games I'm playing and the old ones, uh, an unboxing that I've done, and I might do more of those. Um, also, just asking the Patreon for questions to ask in this live Q&A is one of the things that I'm experimenting with. Um, as far as the future, there's a couple things that I am thinking about trying. One soon and one, I don't know, at some point. Uh, the soon one is I'm thinking about doing some sort of office hours type thing, uh, sort of like this live Q&A, but uh, being live for like three or four hours at a time while I'm working, and then I can just kind of pop in and chat with people as they 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 happen to be in while I'm like editing videos or something like that. Uh, not necessarily streaming what I'm editing, but just kind of being around to chat. Uh, I think that could be kind of fun. That's something I might try before the end of this month, but I don't want to fully commit to that. Um, the other thing that's been knocking around my brain for a long time is it's hard to find all of the content that I've made on Johnny Gets Games for the last eight years, specifically for games. Uh, like, uh, for example, I, I mentioned Aristocracy before. Um, and if you type in John Gets Games Aristocracy into Google, um, I'm not 100% convinced you're going to find the content that I made where I talked about Aristocracy. And that is a concern, <laughs> considering how much I've talked about, specifically in vlog-style format, where I talk about, like, three to, you know, 10 games. There was a couple of years there where uh, I was talking about like 10 to 12 games every time I did one of those impressions vlogs. Uh, and that's that's a worry for me because I'd like people to find my stuff. And honestly, it's frustrating for me sometimes too. Uh, the best way I can actually find this stuff is I go into my Board Game Geek blog where I posted my vlogs and search within there because that is kind of a bulletproof way to find the stuff that I found. But most people aren't going to do that. So I've been thinking about trying to devote some time to making that a part of my website. My website currently has effectively nothing on it. And the idea of making kind of a digest that has 
every single game I've talked about and then a link to the video and the timestamp when I talked about that game. That sounds really attractive. The problem is I've made almost eight years worth of videos, hundreds and hundreds of videos. So this would be a gigantic project and I haven't really taken it on just yet. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be a Patreon exclusive type thing. It's just been something that's been uh, on my mind and I, I haven't really had time to invest some real thought into actually making it happen. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's definitely something that I would like to have happen at some point in the future. I just, I'm just not sure if I'm going to make it happen. And of course, every day I don't do it makes the project harder because every day I put out more stuff. Next up, we have Jonathan Saw. Uh, and they mentioned a disaster being averted because, yeah, I just plugged my computer in before it ran out of battery. Um, they ask, uh, are there any new Euros coming out that are leaning more on elegance, like simple rule sets but great depth? Um, it's hard to say about great depth for games that I haven't actually played, uh, but it does seem like there are some Euros coming out with uh, simpler rule sets. Uh, Brian Boru is one that just arrived here at the house, actually. Um, that one has trick-taking and some area majority and some some really cool stuff going on, but it also has a very lean overall rule set that you could almost teach just by looking at the main board, which is something I, I, I certainly appreciate. Uh, that can drive me a little crazy when you have a game with a whole bunch of little side things and you know a whole bunch of conditional scoring and end game scoring, and then there's no icons for it on the main board. Because when I'm teaching these games, it's so much better to like point over there and be like, okay, here is the round structure. We are in the action round. And then, you know, move on that kind of way. I, I definitely like to have icons and reminders and that kind of stuff printed on the board. Um, as far as other Euros coming out, that might be uh, grabbing me in this way. I'm not really sure. Again, I, I'm so bad at coming up with this stuff on the fly. Um, there's a lot of games coming out. I know there's, uh, if I had gone to Essen, I probably would have come home with 30 plus games just like I have in the past. Uh, and honestly, if I'd done that, I'd probably be uh, a lot quicker at coming up with various examples than just the one example I've have, I have I have right here. If I think of any more, I'll definitely mention it. Um, but it does seem like, you know, not every single Euro that's coming out is crazy complicated with a whole bunch of stuff going on. That's that's not every game. It just feels like it's kind of a trend. Uh, Shrey, uh, it's coming back to the Kinesia question. Uh, I think about the merit badges. They say their top three Kinesia games are Medici, Taj Mahal, and Raw. And I have not played Medici. Uh, that, that one, I guess... Yeah, that could be a merit badge for sure. I've heard about that one for a long time uh, and never gotten around to play it. Although... I could be wrong, but I think there's a bunch of auctions in Medici. And up till uh, 2021, I usually avoided games with auctions. Uh, so that might be part of it. But now I'm pretty much down to try any auction game. Uh, Raw technically has an auction, but it, it feels like its own thing. And Raw is amazing. And I really like Taj Mahal. I played that one three times, I think, and I've considered getting a copy of it. Um, not everyone I played with actually enjoys that game. The last time I played, I had a wonderful time, and one of my opponents had a miserable time. They just did not enjoy that one at all. Uh, it's got this kind of poker, almost uh, 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 bluffing element to it, where you're putting these cards down. It, it can be very punitive in general, but I think it's a really great game. Uh, we've got some more uh, Kinesia games uh, coming in from Hans. They say Samurai, Ra, Taj Mahal, Lost Cities, Tigris and Euphrates, Modern Art, Battle Line, Slash Shot and Totten, Medici, The Quest for El Dorado, and High Society. I have played all of those except for, well, I, I said Medici and Samurai? I don't think I've ever played Samurai with other people. I got the app for it on the iPhone like 10 years ago or something like that, nine years ago, and I played several games of it there. But I don't think I've actually played Samurai with other people. So you know what? That's another Kinesia Mare badge. Uh, I would definitely like to play that one because I remember liking it in the app form, but I don't generally like playing games against artificial intelligence opponents. Um, so that one didn't really stick around. I didn't like keep playing it. I just played it maybe like twice. Uh, so yeah, Samurai. That's one uh, that should definitely be on there. I would like to play that one at some point. Okay, next up we have Elise, and they say, which game that you will be making a video for in the next coming month are you looking forward to the most? Um, hmm. Well, I'm not sure exactly what uh, playthrough with friends videos we're going to do in December, but I have some suspicions. Um, I think it's possible we might be doing one for Brian Boru. We also might be doing one for Messina 1347. And if either of those happen, then those are right at the top of me being quite interested, <laughs> uh, quite excited to actually go through the with those. Um, as far as tutorials are concerned, I actually don't have anything sp uh, scheduled right now for December, I think. It's a little weird. I was looking at my schedule, um, you know, the sponsored tutorials that, um, that people are paying me to make. Um, I don't think I have any for December. It's a bit of a weird uh, month there. So there might be less of the actual tutorial style in December. I'm not really sure what's going to happen there. Uh, but as far as just videos in general, 
I'm hoping to do a playthrough with uh, for Brian Boru uh, as well as potentially for Messina 1347 because those games look super cool. I haven't played either one of those yet, but um, I, I, this is a great opportunity to play them, uh, especially considering we uh, usually do a Friendly Ties podcast episode uh, along with it, and that kind of adds the... Uh, the impetus to play the game a bunch of times to, to really try that kind of stuff out. Uh, so not a, an amazing answer, I think, to your question. Uh, but again, honestly, December is looking a little bit funky. Uh, and considering how much is going on, it's not the end of the world, although not necessarily ideal. Uh, anime says, maybe ask for volunteers to help organize those hundreds of videos. Yeah, so that is something I could do. And um, <laughs> to talk on a, a personal uh, uh, note about that, I feel very uncomfortable about the idea of people volunteering their time for me, uh, for John Gets Games, for for this kind of stuff in general. Um, this is part of the reason why I don't have a Discord chat server or something like that, because those things require moderation, and I just don't feel comfortable asking people to volunteer their time to moderate this thing for me. You know, uh, John Gets Games is me, and John Gets Games is also my job. It's my full-time career, and I just feel weird having people do unpaid labor for me. That just doesn't work for me. But also, I don't think I really have the um, the wherewithal to pay for this labor. So because of that, you know, a lot of these things don't really happen. And that's that's fine. <laughs> I think that's fine. Uh, I, I could definitely, uh, I want to consider doing this kind of thing and maybe chipping away at it as time goes. Uh, but the idea of, of trying to organize people to actually help me out for this makes me quite uncomfortable. Like, personally, emotionally, and whatnot, uh, which is why I, I tend to not do those kind of things. Uh, and hopefully that makes sense. Maybe I'm just a weirdo. <laughs> uh, Elise says, I think the pre-asked questions work well. I didn't mind the back and forth. Great. That is really good to hear. Uh, as I was going to sleep last night, I was laying in bed thinking, how am I going to do this? <laughs> I've got all these questions that came in and I, I want to answer them, but I thought it would be weird to just like talk about a bunch of Patreon questions and then, then go to the chat, which at this point I will probably have ignored for like 20 minutes, like that doesn't feel like a good live experience. So hopefully the bouncing back and forth worked. Uh, I was going to do one and one, but then I kind of on the fly decided to do some and then some. So I don't know. <laughs> I really shouldn't give myself rules on this stuff. Uh, Anime fan X11 says, "Do does your want to play list grow faster than your played slash tried out list? As in, you'll never actually finish it in your lifetime, or do you think you'll actually get through it one day? Uh, I don't think... I will ever get through my want to playlist. It definitely is growing faster than my actual playlist. Uh, part of that's because, you know, just not having that many opportunities to play games. Some people play games like, you know, four plus days a week. Um, I tend to play games two days a week at the maximum. Sometimes I will go a week or two without playing a single game. Um, so that definitely can impact things overall. Um, but yeah, for me, I mean, I think I'm just always so ravenous and, and wanting to learn new things and hearing about new stuff and adding them to the list that I don't think my list is ever going to run out. And honestly, that makes me happy. <laughs> I don't want the list to ever run out. I adore board games. They're one of the, the best parts of my life. And uh, I, I would I would uh, hate to have a moment where I'm just like, oh, I guess I'm done with board games. Who knows? It might happen someday, but uh, I'm hoping it doesn't happen soon if it does have to. Uh, TC says, speaking of Eurogames, I love your t-shirt. Do you remember where you got it? Uh, yes, uh, I got this t-shirt from tebletop.com. That's T-E-E-B-L-E-T-O-P. Uh, they actually have the official John Gets Games merchandise. Uh, you can go to johngetsgames.com slash merch to find the John Gets Games t-shirts. And the reason I actually went with them is because I got this shirt. Uh, I liked the design of it, and I, I bought it, and I wore it, and I thought it felt really nice. So I reached out to the guy who runs it, and he's also the artist behind the stuff, and I commissioned him to make the John Gets Games shirt and then sell them. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you could go there and get this awesome shirt as well as a bunch of others, and you could pick up a John Gets Games shirt if you want to. Um, it might sound like I'm hawking my wares, but I think I make, like, you know, a couple of bucks off each t-shirt. So realistically, that's not a money-making venture for me. It's a, it's fan service. Like, I think the t-shirt looks cool. And I like uh, people having an, uh, the opportunity to get these really cool looking t-shirts that, you know, are associated with the channel. So next up we have Hans. And I think they are answering a question from before about uh, Euro games with um, elegant mechanics. Uh, and they say, Furnace, Free Ride, Mobile Markets, Smartphone Game Inc. Um, Furnace, absolutely. Uh, I played that game, <laughs> I think, a year ago because it technically, I think, came out in 2020, but it's being released in the States now-ish. Um, that's an amazing game. That, that's definitely a wonderful engine-building Euro with this awesome bidding system that is super elegant on the rules. So, yeah, that's certainly a good one. Um, Free Ride is a 
track laying train game, kind of. I played the tabletop simulator mod and was not overly thrilled with it, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Uh, I never talked about it because that was when I was just doing good games and I wasn't really talking about the games I wasn't liking. Uh, and I have not played mobile markets yet, but I'm quite interested too because I did enjoy Smartphone Inc. Uh, so it's good to hear that that's a recommendation. Reishi says, sometimes I want to try new games, but sometimes I just want to grab one that everyone knows how to play, uh, so less downtime or learning the rules or searching for answers in the middle. Um, honestly, that's part of the reason why we've been playing Ark Nova so much and Golem to a slightly lesser extent, but um, <laughs> there is a lot of games to potentially try out there uh, within my, our game group, and we keep just being like, you want to just play Ark Nova? Like, we all know it. <laughs> we've put in the time and effort to learn the game and understand it. We're really enjoying it. Let's just bang out a game of Ark Nova. Uh, so I definitely understand that uh, that feeling. Okay, the next question, and I think the last question is, uh, comes from Om Patel, and they say, have you played Food Chain Magnate? Uh, yes, yes I have. Uh, I've played that one at least twice, maybe three times, and uh, <laughs> it's a splatter type game, which I don't think I'm particularly interested in playing anymore, if that makes sense. Um, at a very high level, it's about creating a food chain, uh, a, a chain of stores. You know, you're selling hamburgers or um, I think root beer or I can't remember everything that you're selling, but um, at its core, you're managing all of your staff and you're setting various prices for things. And I remember being very cutthroat with the pricing uh, where you would market specific prices and then someone would be, somebody would undercut you by like $1 uh, and then they would sell all this stuff. You wouldn't sell any of your stuff. Then all of your stuff spoils. And then you're feeling bad. Uh, a lot of people love Food Chain Magnate. Uh, a good friend of mine owns a copy of it, and I think he's down to play it pretty much whenever. But I think after playing it about three times, I've I've seen enough of it to know that it's not really a game for me. Yeah, okay, I think that's going to bring this one to a close. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined in uh, on this live, and thank you to the uh, patrons who asked questions. Um, if anybody has feedback about how that went with the Patreon questions being uh, intermingled throughout the various uh, the chat, then please let me know. I love to see feedback. Um, it seemed to go relatively well from my perspective. I definitely liked answering a couple at the beginning before questions actually cycled in. Uh, so yeah, I think that is going to bring this uh, live Q&A vlog to a close. I'll do another one of these in about a month. Uh, I'm not sure the exact date so far, but I always announce it during the update vlog that happens in the first week or so of December. So keep your eye out for that if you'd like to join in on one of these in the future. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.